And welcome everyone, and as you can all see, we are right in front of the Dark Rift as the crew of the Delphinus uh, try to make their way through uh, this seemingly impassable uh, dark sky rift that uh, plagues the skies uh, to the west, uh, to the east even. So, uh, what will we find when we go in? Who knows? Well, I do, but uh, I've played this game before, so there we go. Anyway, I'm once again joined by my colleague here. Hello. Hello, hello. And uh, we've actually just been, we've just this moment at the time of recording been delivered uh, a plethora of questions uh, relating to um, our, our latest uh, releases on the YouTube channel here. So, yes, uh, timely been... indeed. Mere, mere minutes later and they wouldn't have been able to reach us inside the rift. Precisely. That's it. It's, it's shut off from the rest of the world, you see. Mm. There we go. Um, I think oh, just before we dive peaceful, into actually, the questions... It's quite peaceful, actually, now that you put it like that. Just, just, <laughs> so, yeah. Just before we dive into the questions, I want to um, to quickly have a little talk about the Dark Rift now that we can see see what it looks like on the inside. This is one of those things uh, for all across. Um, I would have sorely loved to have had some kind of similar setting or or location uh, or you know mm, just yeah. natural structure in in the show. And obviously, we do have the. Um, the Northwest Passage, I believe, or this, no wait, this, or South, South whatever, whatever it's called. Uh, it's when the skies go dark and there's yellow and blue sky particle combining together and whatnot. It's when they go to um, uh, Blue Alto, obviously, which is basically Aftama, uh, which is the place that uh, Vice and his crew are heading just now. And uh, so we had that passageway, but it was an open passageway of you know dangerous sky weather patterns. That was basically it. Not not like this kind of almost supernatural, ethereal, um, living plant-based yeah, world. Sort of, some very creepy sort of, music. Sort of monstrous stomach kind of air to it in the game. Ab absolutely. From um, Pinocchio. Yeah, and it's... it's uh, there's to, to Honestly, there, there isn't any other part of the game that quite immersed me as much as this bit did uh, when I was young, when I, very, when I first played this. I have to say, it wasn't necessarily a pleasant experience because the Dark Rift, um, not only was I horrendously badly prepared for fighting the monsters in here because I just wasn't very good at RPGs back then at all, but also um, y the ship seems to move slower. There are current wind currents that move the ship against the flow. Um, you can get lost very easily. You can, all you can end up returning to the beginning of the dungeon if you go into the wrong pockets and that sort of thing and just it's not a very clear path through you you have to sort of go up down left and right it's not just about going forward and you know to your sides and that sort of thing you've got to think in a three-dimensional aspect of course playing it this time around I I'd recalled just enough of it uh, since I'd played uh, I played this game a couple times it used to be a, a yearly event for me um, so I did know my way through it uh, a lot better, but uh, it was primarily luck that you're about to see that I happened to do it almost in you know the perfect order that you could to get all the secret hidden things in this. Of course, yes, it's it's a very delicate balance when you're trying to create an area of a game that's supposed to be disorienting. At what point does that just become frustrating? It, exactly. I think it wasn't helped by the fact that I see whenever I seem to play the Dark Rift, including for recording for this video, it seems to be at, at night. When I'm, you know, after a long day of, you know, doing stuff or whatnot, and maybe the appropriate, but yes, also, yeah. yes, frustrating. Frustrating. Um, but there we go. Well, um, appropriately enough, as we as we uh, head off into uh, this kind of uh, isolated space, um, we hmm. have uh, a slew of questions about uh, about Kamen Rider Fake, uh, yes. which I think we can we can agree plays with aspects of of isolation itself. Exactly. Um, uh, and uh, these come in the main from uh, Gokai Platinum, um, who asks, uh, what is the song used in episode six of Kamen Rider Fake? The, the song that's used in, in the final episode, in episode six, is called uh, For the Love of Life. Um, and uh, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Uh, you can find it on YouTube and in, in various other places. Uh, the name of the singer escapes me, and I do the artist escapes me, and I do apologize for that. I don't have it to hand, but... Um, I felt it was the perfect um, piece uh, for it to be used, and in fact, it was actually uh, used as the the ending theme of an anime, uh, which which is very frightening. Um, not because it's a horror piece necessarily, although there are definitely horror elements in it. Uh, it's called Monster, 
uh, I, if anyone has a firm um, sense of, I had to say, a firm sense of, you know, a strong stomach, shall we say, uh, mm. <laughs> I would say uh, check it out because it's uh, a very poignant philosophical inwardly focused show uh, about uh, the nature of humanity and um, sure. so I yeah, do give that a, ch a check and they use that song as their, their ending theme much as Kamen Rider Fake did yeah. so it's the kind of it's the kind of horror that's uh, you know that, that would uh, uh, might be best experienced by, by those with a strong sense of, of self you know not, not easily rocked by uh, uh, yes, right. that's probably the best way. It's not necessarily gore. It's it is um, something that you should go in if you're you know mentally doing okay. Uh, <laughs> perhaps right. I shouldn't have have watched that at the time that I did. But anyway, no, the it's it's uh, it's a very interesting look into into the human psyche and uh, and things that we consider to be normal and correct uh, end mm. up perhaps not being so normal and correct. But uh, that's entirely up to the viewer themselves to decide. Quite, quite. Ah, well, um, no, glad to have that one pinned down because it's a, you know, it's a very affecting piece of music that uh, uh, that closes out fake. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm. Yes. Um, uh, further from Gokai Platinum, um, they uh, they want to know uh, about the character of Rose from uh, from Fake, and mm. uh, they'd like to know whether that character is intended to be female. Yes, um, as as with uh, Fake being, uh, you know, at the very start of the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that happened at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, um, just for posterity, I'll record that. It's not like we're out of it yet, but <laughs> there you go, in case anyone's listening back to it later. Um, that was the point where uh, I basically uh, had no, no contact with, with other, anyone, be them physically, uh, cast-wise, or... Um, or even uh, being able to get lines from people online at, at that point due to you know needing people needing to focus on you know f doing paid work basically <laughs> you know and, and uh, you know use their time effectively to to survive such a difficult period of time um, rather than work on a free show which I completely understand um, anyway the, the point was that Rose Rose was intended to be voiced by by um, by a female uh, actor and uh, it was not meant to be of course so I I Everything you see in fake is me, and yeah. everything you hear in fake is me. Uh, I, it's probably fairly obvious that that is the case. It's one of the few works I think that there are no credits in because it's it's literally just me. I play all of the 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 suit characters. Uh, I obviously play Zero. Um, I I do the the voice of Rose, and uh, I do uh, all the well <laughs> as always. I do all the the post production as well. Um, For sure. So yeah, that that was that was it. Rose is intended to be female. I I thought about perhaps putting a filter on or putting on a more feminine voice, but at the end I thought no, let's just leave it as as the voice that I used, and I just spoke normally in the intonation that I thought that Rose would be saying the the dialogue. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be Actually, would be better. With with the understanding that of course times were what they were and are what they are and nobody could be reproached for being unable to contribute. Were no. there any particular cast members that you're able to tell us you had in mind for Rose or any other part in the series? Uh, well, originally, in, in the original script, we had um, two brand new people were due to be uh, the Valkyrie and Vulcan characters who, uh, name-wise, I will not reveal because the names have been recycled into our current show. Um, that we're working on, but the character names I won't reveal. Um, but uh, yes, we did have two new new members. In fact, you can see the person who was going to be our our common writer Valkyrie in our Valkyrie screen test that we have on. Um, I see on the YouTube page. We do have that screen test, uh, and they uh, came along to to do that. Um, that was that was actually just at the start of this year, I believe. In January, we had them come along, and it was really good to have them. Uh, come and do a proper sort of transformation scene and everything. We got to try a couple of the, the costume pieces that we'd been sourcing uh, for the show as well. Um, mm. Whether or not that will still be how, how it works out cast-wise or not, we, we don't know because uh, obviously, you know, scheduling conflicts and all the rest of it, that's, that's it. But it was good to get them over to do the transformation. So, that was good. Uh, for a tidbit there, I am the one doing the suit, the suit work there. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> 
there is that. That's why we have such a smooth uh, transformation of being able to step into exactly where the, the actor was standing rather than doing a cutaway like we normally do with, with writer transformations in the, the screen tests when it's just me running camera and doing you know the in-suit and out-of-suit because it involves... You know, you see these sort of 30 second, 40 second long transformation scenes. And you think, oh, that's a, that's a nice little thing that they went out and did. And it's actually, no, that took about seven hours. Because uh, mm. <laughs> you have to go back in, get changed, go back out, film with the suit on, get into shot, make sure it works and everything. Get out of the suit again, you know. Leave time for lunch. <laughs> yes, time, time for lunch as well. Yes, I've, I have had lunch in a suit once. That was quite amusing. <laughs> Must have been an experience, yes. Certainly. Um, uh, I'd, I'd um, say furthermore on the uh, on the subject of Rose was there um, uh, not not necessarily specifically because they were uh, intended or, or are intended to be female but um, because uh, you go in the in the prologue to fake the the zero one prologue that, that yes. uh, was previously available um, mm. uh, from having uh, Mayumi as as uh, as Zero's um, you know uh, person in the chair, you know, yes. um, uh, support from uh, from from the computer in the background, um, to a, a similar situation with Rose, not a, you know not uh, not identical because obviously Rose hasn't uh, hasn't access to to resources and you know a yes. compute computer support is replaced with kind of jaded quips. Um, yes. But uh, was there was there an intention that the that the relationship should parallel one another in in that way? Um, I should cl- I I'm not sure if everyone figured it out or knows it, and I've actually purposefully not answered questions like this before in comments, knowing that we'd probably Please, yeah. come up to. But I should clarify that fake and um, and uh, the prologue are are the same universe. Are the same. Oh yes, yeah. sorry. I, I I assumed that was a given, but uh, right. Yes, I I, I, I feel like I read something. You're right. It's, yeah, I feel like I read something at some point where it wasn't quite clear for to someone that if, if it had been, obviously Mayumi being specifically named, mentioned, and the the photograph of Mayumi being in the in the in, in the show. That's the thing. Yes. I will I will go out and say that basically that there are supposed to be parallels there, and it is because we didn't have Mayumi's. Uh, voice actor <laughs> anymore um, as well that oh, Mayumi was, was, was not in the, the subsequent pieces because um, she does get shot at the end of um, the prologue but that was you know that doesn't mean you're dead uh, so that was the intention there um, hmm. but yeah I'd, but that was a matter of availability that, that made, decided that story yeah. beat or? yeah so that's that's the way that that worked out um, but uh, the character of Rose was was always uh, intended to be something uh, in addition to that. So we just you know basically had that instead of different things happening. Um, I, I'll also go out and say because now that we're done with with that chapter of, of filmmaking, um, and it won't be coming back, I, I assure you that <laughs> uh, that. Uh, how do you make sure I get this right so it's easy enough to understand? That's one of my biggest weaknesses, I think. Um, mm-hmm. mm, the fake is set in a world where crash slash evil slash villains have already won. Um, there, there are, yes. there are something that I don't know if people heard or not. If you listen closely to the episodes of Fake, you will hear distant war sounds, distant explosions, distant gunfire, distant shuffle of feet, that kind of thing. It's It prevails throughout almost the entire show. In fact, I think it's only when you're in the bunker I don't think you can hear it. Then again, maybe you can in some scenes. I'd have to check it. I haven't watched it back myself in a long time. But yeah, definitely when they're outside and for the majority of the show you hear distant war sound uh, Foley effects in the background. Now that is, in my mind, that is it's the, the apocalypse or the after apocalypse basically of basically all of humanity has become these shells there is no um, there is no there are no more humans left there's no more people there's no more uh, everything has has failed basically that sort of thing. sure so it's it is a sense that zero is uh, either choosing not to be aware of this or genuinely you know literally can't go far enough without getting shot at from where he is he's just running away on a little Honda Honda bike oh. that he's managed to source 
Um, and he can't win, because he's literally the only one left with this incredibly subpar power set, if you want to say it that way. And uh, he, he takes meds and all the rest of it that are you know synthesized from digital seeding and etc which is mentioned in uh, one of the things but we didn't get to flesh out unfortunately because of the, the the length of the show and various other constraining right. factors but yeah so it's it's a it's a failed situation where um where uh, it is the same character from um from uh, uh, the prologue and uh, zero as mm. as you can see is now a, an older individual in that uh, he's I wouldn't say he's a full-on old man, but he looks as old as he does in the in the show. So, because he's a cyborg, he, he does age. He's, he's got mechanical parts and all the rest of it, but he's not immortal. No, definitely not. No, no. Uh, right, I'm at a slight loss here because that's a you know that's a fantastically textured little detail that I wish I literally noticed in any form before. Um, but uh, no, I, I I did not notice that uh, that the background. Uh, kind of soundscape was was so deliberately chosen, um, but I'll I'll definitely be revisiting with a with an ear out for that. Um, fortunately, uh, in the absence of my own words, Gokai Platinum has more. Were well, sorry, were I beg your pardon. Were there additional plans for the characters of Vulcan, Valkyrie, Crow? What about Rose? Yes, there were many additional plans for those characters. Um, which uh, could could have should have would have been. I had the show hit the fourteen or fifteen episodes that we had we had uh, scripted and filmed a lot of suit footage for, which, all involving me um, on screen. Um, but uh, and I basically took what I could from from that footage and used it in um, in uh, in the sh the final episode basically to also to let people see the you know, the what we had in stock at the time as well, just to let them see what was on the go. Um, uh, but uh, I can't say any more about certain things because I've recycled a number of thoughts and ideas from from fake into into the show that we're working on. And actually, it could end up that they don't get used, but at the moment, they are in there. So that's, that's I, I don't want to give away story points because I'm still one of those strange creators who doesn't want to spoil everyone before the movie comes mm. out. <laughs> Understandable. Um, and uh, finally, in fact, um, I'll just use this as the opportunity to tick off uh, my question because I think we've already kind of been around the houses, kind of way answered it anyway. Um, so, the current project from FX Riders, uh, this new adaptation of, mm. of Kamen Rider Zero One, is totally separate from Kamen Rider Fake and the Zero One prologue. Totally separate, complete, completely removed. Uh, you don't need to have seen anything else before this in any of the things I've ever worked on or done before. This is... Uh, I had intended to close the, the book on everything at the end of uh, All Across. Um, and then we had a couple false starts with the audio drama. And uh, then, after closing that, we, uh, we, we had uh, the prologue and... And then fake, and so it's it's all been kind of a hey, we're starting new, and then oh, actually, just kidding, that's that's not the start. Uh, <laughs> ignore all of that, not ignore it, but uh, uh -huh. keep it separate. That's I I, I like to consider um, for my own sanity. I consider the end of the live action all across the first series, the true end of of all of that, and that's nicely bookended for me. Uh, the three things that happened in the middle, which are the audio drama, uh, the Zero One prologue, and Fake, those are just little bonus things, which I hope that people mm. got enjoyment out of, uh, or some hopefully some knowledge out of, or food for thought in, in the latter cases. Um, uh, if you enjoyed it as well, that's great too. Uh, <laughs> bonus. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, so you don't need to have seen anything prior to this. This, this is, and given the amount of funding we've put into this good god uh this is the true new beginning this is the first of fx riders uh and everything else you've seen up until now was what was it they said at the beginning of that terrible Yu-Gi-Oh movie from 2004 everything else was just practice let's hope that that doesn't mark the bar for what we'll be doing but there we go oh was that like the poster tagline or something from that the... that was the trailer that i just remember this big booming voice at the end of the trailer for the the Yu-Gi-Oh the movie pyramid of light that was in cinemas uh, in 2004 
I don't know how I remember that, but I do. Just the, the, the narrator just went, everything else was just practice. So, there you go. Yes, it's, it's vaguely coming back to me. I just remember the high points and the free cards. Um, yeah, that was, hey, loved it as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, no, it's good to, it's good to have a, a line drawn there um, because, yes, it's, uh, it's obviously difficult to, to talk about an ongoing project when its final ideal form is still kind of amorphous and, and, and solidifying. But, um, yes, yeah, solidifying it's, it's... a lot more these days. Uh, we're, mm-hmm. I can say that we've actually begun filming. Um, I say we because we actually have other people now. Um, really? There is Fine. there is a production team, an actual production team, but it's going to be slow goings because it's getting actual camera people over and actual um, behind the scenes stuff going too. So it's uh, you've never seen anything like this, is all I can say. And I I hope I mm. hope to God that <laughs> that it's enjoyed anyway. <laughs> Other deities are available. Uh, yes, yes. Um. May they be praised if they're listening. Um, but uh, uh, Gokai Platinum uh, signs off with uh, a question about the uh, the analogous uh, stories to, uh, to potentially out there to to um, Kamen Rider Fake, and they asked whether there is any real life parallel uh, intended when Zero discusses his relationship with Kamen Rider, or when he thinks of its role in his and Mayumi's situation. Absolutely, hundred percent. Well spotted. It's kind of obvious, I think, but yeah, that is definitely, that is definitely it. Mm. It's it's uh, it's uh, word for word. Mm-hmm. So is that is that is that something that they've uh, that they've honed in on the Gokai Platinum has has, has keyed in on there that uh, that uh, zero story That's shadows some real life aspect. Yes, definitely. That's. Um, that's that's a that's a personal statement I, I wanted to make in the, the episode. Something I don't o- often do, but uh, that's that's my particular feelings on um, on the on the actual franchise and also on just you know entertainment in general. And I've I've talked about this before, and I will since that we're is on the true. Topic, yes, um, I, I will. Yeah, mm-hmm. sorry. It's good. To, no, it's good. It's good to air it um, in the cold light of day um, because uh, whether. Whether it's doing it metatextually or or just within its own, you know, or or, or just as a kind of a, um, or whether it's kind of an in character part of the story in a weird way. Zero, uh, not zero one. Uh, fake does does begin its journey, does it not, by stating, "Don't don't look for parallels to to anything. This is this doesn't mean anything." Precisely. And so is that um, is that more? How do I even word it? Is that is is that is that more? Um, a, a, is that is that telling us some something, but actually sh- more showing us the headspace of the show rather than rather than telling us what we should be doing? Yes. Um, one one thing I've been told in the past was that uh, we should never tell the audience what to think because. Here's the thing, whether you tell them or not, they're going to think what they want to think, and that's how it should be, mm. um, for better or for worse. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, that is that we can only, uh, as, as a creator, as someone who puts anything out, that you can only put out what you put out, and at the end mm. of the day, it's not up to you how someone receives it. You can yeah. only hope that they receive it in a positive way that is helpful in some mm-hmm. way. Well, at least in my, my book, that's what I... I look for yes. when I do something. I don't ever want someone to, 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 to be sent on a negative journey or on a negative thought reel from from anything I've put together. But g- going forward now, I feel that um, fake being you know worlds different from from and 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 uh, the, the prologue as well, I suppose to some extent, it, it, worlds apart from previous works that I've mm. um, I've done on. Uh, I hope that. Um, and part of the reason there is a warning at the beginning is that uh, I, I, I think that the best way to explain this is I'd, I want to invoke a sense of disturbia in the piece itself, not in the, the audience who are watching it. So I want people to be aware that 
Um, it's you know it's not something you should probably see when you're younger, and it's not something that uh, in, until you. I mean, maybe you could, but you know, it's you need to be ready for for that sort of thing. I think, and whether I captured it as you know significantly or seriously as I thought I did, I thought it best to put that warning there. Um, uh, so yeah, um, mm -hmm. I did I did get a bunch of people saying it's not really that, you know bad you know, or, or it's not really like 18 plus or, or that kind of thing but my 18 no, plus but it is, is hopeless kind of... yes so. um, no that's that, that's very interesting no, I, I hadn't I hadn't thought of um, previously of kind of considering the, um, the the prologue text narration to be a character in itself um, mm, certainly that was and it's my hope and it invokes a lesson that it's taken me a a frighteningly long time to learn, which is that you can, you know, you can learn the principle of, of show don't tell within within film, um, but that is much more widely applicable than than you think it is. For example, um, if a character is speaking dialogue that doesn't mean they're not showing something, um, yes, you know, a, a character can be telling you a thing, but the fact that what they're choosing to tell you shows you something about that character, if you like. Of course. Of course. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to dive for the nearest example because it's one that's personal to me, but uh, I understand it not, may not be one that... Uh, hmm. You know what? I've just realised there may be people listening for whom this is also a spoiler, so I, I, as awkward as it may be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to turn out Back of out. this nosedive and just leave Back out. Bail out, Red 2. Bail yeah. out. Exactly. <laughs> Stay on target. Um, but uh, no, the, the point is that you can, you can have a character expressing something, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the audience is being told the information that they're being given. You have things like yes. the unreliable narrator trope, for example, where a character is narrating their own life, but they are, you know, for whatever reason, purposefully telling a, 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 an altered version of events and the fact that they're doing that tells the audience something about the narrator themselves or it shows it if you like um, anyway yes no it's, it's just a very interesting little uh, little knot hole I thought about there um, I'm, I'm glad that's that's good I, I certainly hope that fake um, has invoked that sort of thought in whoever's you know watched it actively mm. um, I, uh, I have some other stuff that we can talk about besides fake but while we're on it I, I have I have a question that's it's not mine, but the person who asked it to me, I didn't know the answer, and it made me curious enough that I'd, that I'd really like to, to find out. Um, it's, it's not ultimately important, but as you say, you know, uh, fake is the, the most coarse in terms of the material oh, yes. that, uh, that Certainly. you've put out in any, in any of your works, and I think the most obvious evidence of that is the cursing and the foul language. Um, yes. What I'm interested to know is, was that there before you did the ADR for Vic? No. No. It was mm. not. That's, that's that was, really interesting, because it wasn't that was, me that, that spotted that. It was all that, added but, in later. Mm. Yes, because uh, some... But, I, it may even have been Gokai Platinum that, that asked me about this, but uh, um, but in, in any case, it, uh, yeah, the, the idea, as soon as, as, soon as I... I you know, was made aware of it. It's all I could see. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, yes. You mm -hmm. you never see anyone actually mouthing the, the mm. curse words, I believe. So yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> unless you had to, you know, unless you had to get uh, a clip of, of, you know, like I've uh, when I've been trying to creatively fit ADR into into projects, perhaps even the one I'm working on at the moment. Then I can um, imagine. I've I've looked every which way at the existing footage to the point of playing existing unrelated lines, vi <laughs> visuals line, lines, backwards in an attempt to get the mouth movements to match up. And there have been a couple of, I, w I won't say shining successes because it's never going to be totally perfect, but there have been a couple that have been so damnably close that mm. I, I could hardly believe my luck that somewhere in that Mass of unconnected mouth movements. Somebody played backwards could, could, you know, sort of form part of the sentence I wanted to be there rather than the one that was. Um, 
I mean, but, um, I will yeah. just go out and say this to for to you and to anyone else who's listening. And of course, it's not always an option, but my best bet to you, whether or not you you, you think it's a good one, is cut away to something else and just put the dialogue. <laughs> oh yes, no, I, I, I've there's plenty of that for for me you know, now and over the years as well. I, I I repeat myself, this project has taken years, but um, the. Uh, um, uh, the it's fact not is that always my, doable. Yeah, bec- because I don't have the the patience um, or sometimes the, the time um, and sometimes the voice to um, uh, mm. to to ADR an entire scene with replacement dialogue. My ADR will typically be just the crucial parts replaced. So I will right. want to try and do as much of my limited audio editing as I'm able to. To try and make it match up with the cadence and the and the, the recording, you know, kind of artifacts of, of the existing onset dialogue, which rarely works to uh, you know to a great degree, and therefore, any anything I can add in to make it more seamless is is always welcome. Marvelous. Mm. But um, thank you very much. That was a that was a much you know that was that was a, a much more um, yeah. That, that that was less of a fundamental and much much, uh, much uh, more of just a, a little a little trickle of extra detail to add in at the end there and something mm. crucial to to fake itself. But um, yes, glad to get a, a thorough exploration in. Um, from the end, as you've now just declared it, back to the beginning, um, we've talked a fair about. Uh, a fair amount about Lyrium, um, its mm. false start and then its actual start, um, and mm. so on yes, and so that's forth. True. Um, what I'd uh, like to try and bring to light just now is its inspiration, not merely Zelda, which it is, is of <laughs> well, course directly lifting for, but what specific event inspired the creation of Lyrium? You know that's that's a really good thing because that goes beyond what we've often touted as our our, our origin, at least with well, the ninja origin anyway. In some ways, yeah. that was our first sort of you know jump to YouTube thing, uh, in, in a way. Uh, it was the ninja inspired, of course, by Ninja Moon, which we've talked before, Indeed. and uh, Dash Malone, uh, who is still uh, making stuff um, occasionally, which is lovely to see. Um, Unfortunately, yeah. the way that YouTube works, I can't send him a direct message again to say, you know, we're st- oh thanks, we're still here. Uh, <laughs> but there we go. Anyway, uh, Mr. Malone, if you're listening, thank you. There you go. Uh, you're probably not, but <laughs> if you are. <laughs> if you like Skies of Arcadia, <laughs> you might be. <laughs> anyway, no. Um, our thanks, Agent, to the ether, nonetheless. Yes, we've said it. It depends if anyone can hear through the dark rift or not, but there we go. Mm, Well. Anyway. um, But yes, uh, to get back on point for the question, yes, um, the the true inspiration for the beginning of all of this, uh, and it's actually a group of filmmakers I've had the pleasure of meeting in Mm. person, uh, which was a stroke of luck. Um, uh, My colleague and I are, of course, massive Legend of Zelda fans, and as you do, when you're hanging out playing Yu-Gi-Oh cards in 2005 or whatever it was at the time, <laughs> you, you uh, or four, maybe we'd just seen the movie of Pyramid of Light. No, get back to that. Um, we we were chatting about the new game coming out, which everyone was waiting for, which was of course the Legend of Zelda: Twilight Princess. And uh, I do believe uh, we had a you had a had an Edge magazine, which is a, a UK game magazine which had a glorious, absolutely glorious cover with the Twilight Princess stylized Hylian shield on the front of it. And we were just kicking back on a summer afternoon, Mm -hmm. reading this copy of Edge, looking at all the the new jokes about the names of household air conditioning systems. Well, yeah, Dimplex. (laughs) We hardly knew ye. That, that heater's gone now, but anyway, yeah. yeah so we're kicking back. We're 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 talking. We're reading reading this magazine, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, for whatever reason, we we I think maybe I'd found it. I was like, hey hey, I should show you this this uh, this trailer for this uh, movie that's coming out. And of course, it was a fan made movie, and it was uh, particularly good looking for the time. Remember, this is two thousand five. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we'd found uh, a Legend of Zelda fan film, which was heavily inspired by um, Ocarina of Time, of 
course. As you do, uh, yep. And taking a look at it. And uh, uh, they, they were touting that the movie would be out one day. When that day would be, we uh, it would be quite a while away, it seemed. But uh, yes, that um, the trailer was incredibly promising. It was a marvelous, you know, looking amateur film. You could tell it was amateur, and to look back at it now, there are you know tons of problems with it. But as far as like in terms of getting props, costumes, actors, and actual you know choreography and other things going on, mm. um, the ambition uh, was enormous. That was truly tremendous, um, and. Uh, I, I, th- I remember watching that trailer countless times, just just in general, just on on YouTube or on on their website, I should say that they had. And um, then uh, it took years and years for them to get it. And I think by that point we were in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, and we were well into mm-hmm. Ninja Land. And by the way, sorry, this this is the movie that inspired Lyrium. Just in case that wasn't clear, uh, <laughs> I should yes. say that oh, right. Lyrium, which was by this point firmly in our rearview mirror. Yes, and uh, the years went by, and um, I happened to in two thousand nine. I I left the um, the UK uh, temporarily to go and study in Southern California, and uh, I can't remember if it was you who pointed this out or if I just happened to be browsing the the website just to see how the film was coming and if maybe I would get to see it one day or something mm. if it was on the way. And it came to my attention that they were doing a screening of it about an hour north of where I was. They, the, the, and the, the, the production team and the director and everyone would, and some of the actors would all be there. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was like a five pound university college campus showing. It's five pound, five dollars, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get that right. <laughs> brought along mar- they, they brought t- along the wrong t- money and uh, didn't get your ticket. It was a disaster. It was a disaster, yeah. No, thankfully that didn't happen. I had rupees, you see. Anyway. Ah, no, they, 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 um... They brought me in. They didn't bring me in. I, I got there with a, a friend who, who had a car. Uh, I managed to tout them into going to see an amateur film uh, mm. with me uh, in a cinema setting. There were a bunch of cosplayers from, from Zelda. Was, there was a Sheik. There was a, a, a Princess Zelda. There was a couple of Lynx and that sort of thing. I wasn't dressed up. I would have been if I'd had a costume, though. Mm. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so we went into the, the cinema. Unfortunately, we arrived, like, five minutes late, so I missed the very start. Um <sighs> But uh, that was fixed later when they released the file uh, online later. Yes. Um, but uh, anyway, so I sat in the, the theatre, I got to see the film, and um, despite at the end of it with a number of less lesser uh, understanding individuals saying that was the lowest budget piece of whatever I've ever seen, you know, whatever, but they hey, they sat through the whole thing, mm. um, etc., uh, I, and I saw the, the, the director and, and his crew and uh, they were doing interviews with some of the people who'd come out, obviously, so I, I went up there. I made it into the cut, I have to say. I've seen I've seen their little after-show documentary that they did. I'm in it. Excellent. Uh, because I knew I could get in it by saying exactly the truth that, you know, why I was there. I said, I'm, I'm from the United Kingdom. I've been following this film since 2005. Of course, and, yes. And they thought that I had flown over from the UK <laughs> to see this film, I did. Oh. I did come clean after the after the interview. I said I'm actually studying here, and it was just a really happy coincidence. But mm. I was really happy to come over here and uh, and do it. They actually did ask me. They said, we're, oh, "We're so sorry. We made you spend a plane ticket fare to come." They, oh no, don't worry. I'm actually <laughs> studying. But uh, yeah, they they threw me in the the docu for that. So that was really good. And uh, so, if any of you ever see that, I don't know if the docu is still still online. In some regards, you can you can keep an eye out for me mm. at the uh, at the interview point after the film was screened because I think that was the first showing. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, yeah yeah. yeah I, mean, I I don't remember much about the specifics of, of the point where the film actually did release, but I I know there was uh, you know there was some legal trouble because um, uh, of course uh, after after they started releasing it online. I mean, a university campus, you know, showing a film that a bunch of amateur filmmakers has made, that's fine. But yeah. if you start putting it online and and it is essential and it is exactly the thing, not that I can speak in some ways, I suppose, but and it is basically, you know, straight up Legend of Zelda, yeah. you know, movie. They, that's not okay, not with mm. the, the makers anyway. Now, yeah. um, it's not like they were trying to make any money of it or anything like that you know and I always think that in regards to that if you're not turning a profit on something and it's done 
you know, in, in a way that it's been funded by, you know, supporters or crowdfunding or that kind of thing, and you're not profiting and all the proceeds go into the production that you're doing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But at the end of the day, the the way that things work is that it's their IP and they mm. take it away. And you For can't sure. really yeah. argue with that. So that's yeah. yes, that. Anyway, I will say, and I'll go on record, that uh, it may in fact be possible to still see this film. It, it may indeed. Some people yep. may even have a copy on their hard drive. Who knows? It is entirely um, possible that mm-hmm. there are at least two people who may who may have a copy of that film on their hard drive. We don't know who they are, mm. but uh, they may in indeed. fact have that film and may enjoy that film very, very much. Indeed, and, yes. And uh, they may not have had an excuse to watch it in a little bit of uh, a little bit of a while, but uh, they would certainly uh, yeah you know, love <laughs> love to dig it out at some point. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> There we go. I, I can't remember the name of that that filmmaking group. So whoever you are, thank you. If you're watching, you must enjoy Skies of Arcadia. Make a Skies of Arcadia film. I'll watch it. Yes. Ah, oh, for about two seconds there, I was about to go ah because I thought, oh, I must be able to remember. But as soon as I reached in there, the box was empty. Can't actually remember their names. Um, but yeah, my uh, oh, like I can remember kind of sparse details of of our journey of following. That you know that production um, as mm. it's you know as it touted itself then seemed not to be happening then seemed to pick up steam again in the wake of, yeah. of Lyrium by that point um, yeah it was it was weird someone claimed to, that we to were totally responsible it. for that but uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no I'm sure they they, they never saw our uh, our film um, no, no probably probably better for us if we're honest yes um, uh, but uh, yes yeah, so we we. Uh, I think it must have been you that found the trailer and, and we watched it and were you know in, in awe of, of everything they were attempting there and just how much of it they they'd brought to to the screen for uh, for just you know just that brief two minutes um, mm. and then it yes, would be the, wrong to say it was the only inspirational Zelda thing that that hit us off on that because there was also yes that a was completed fan film that. yes yes by Danny Sammons Jr. and I believe mm. the film is still available to, to view on online but they no longer make film um, mm. it was it was called Legend of Link and uh, it was a sort of tongue in cheek almost sketch show but there were scenes this that were y- yeah there were there were scenes where it was a lot more real and a lot more mm. like genuine like there, there were darker scenes and there were more like you know see i have a feeling they probably started making it serious and then <laughs> it sort of they, they they as the time went on much in the way of the ninja in some ways uh, there are you know there's serious moments in that and some very silly moments in others for sure um probably not you know at the start and you know it gets it just all over the place in that case but with this i mean for example you'd have a scene where ganondorf attacks hyrule castle quite seriously kills the king and you know does all this sort of thing and then the next moment he walks into to what is supposed to be hyrule castle's interior which is clearly someone's house and starts playing super smash brothers on the gamecube with his soldiers Indeed. and it, it was just because they had such they had such a good setup to it and it was very epic and cool you know it wasn't as high budget clearly or you yes. know as well put together as I think as crucially crucially it, it looked like everyone had had an absolute blast making that together um, yes. everyone just seemed to be having such a good time and not for nothing like the the, the idea of this unmade uh, hero of time was the, the name of the the first movie that we talked about. So oh, that was I it. Yes, it, yes, it started off as Legend of Zelda: Hero of Time, I think, and then morphed into simply Hero of Time um, near to its release. And it, yes. it it sparked in us not only the will to well, if they're not going to get this done, then we better just do something ourselves, but also <laughs> yeah, yes. the need to search the ether for Legend of Zelda fan film material that could satisfy us and that's that's how yeah. we I mean it, it was a friend that put me on to Legend of Link but I wouldn't have thought to ask the question if I hadn't already been you know been, been there was a there was a thirst there that uh, needed yeah. satisfied um, but um, no it is uh, Hero of Time it is a fascinating thing to watch as well because um, it's as you say you know the ambition is, is there to cinematic levels it's just imperfect enough that you can see that it was mm. made by a you know by a fan group but that just kind of lends charm to it like to the I point where so too. 
I mean, like it does things that even you know, big budget movies aren't immune to. I think you can. I said that this production seemed to stop then start again, and I think it's fairly clear when you watch it that the second block. Um, they maybe didn't have the same wig for for Link that they had the first <laughs> time around, yes, and it's yes. it's much more kind of boofed up um, yes. rather than the more curly wig they had in the uh, in the in the first um, block. The second block mm. stuff seems to be more heavily leaning on green screen and adding CGI um, yes. uh, elements, whereas it seemed like all of the uh, most, if not all, of their on location stuff happened in their in their first big big filming block um, yeah no it's just like all, all these things just give you more to to look at and, and soak up the, the charm of it I find um, mm. and that's not even the the end of the list because yeah the, you know that that led us to the, the tongue in cheek version that is uh, Legend of Link as, as you say um, and then I think it was it was you that, that discovered yet another um, hot contender for, for competent Zelda fan film uh, in the Sage of Darkness movie. Yes, remember that one? Yes, that's right. Yes, I remember yeah. that too. Mm-hmm. That was it another was... one that we discovered. I think it was already made when you know it was it was already out. There yeah, it was already it. done. Um, it was very well done, um, and uh, just you know the VFX in it were were particularly well well spliced in as well. I think mm. that. Looking at it now, I would, unfortunately, in some ways, I would say that's sort of the level that we reached in all across. It took us that long to, <laughs> to, to get to that because um, the although I would say the cinematography um, could have been better in places, the actual like VFX and mm. uh, you know ins and outs and the, the the costuming and whatnot was significantly. Uh, you know, higher quality than 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 what we'd done before. Yeah. Um, that said, I think that there's a particular um, thing when going into a, a period piece like that, with which is you know serious. Um, I've I, I think we we were able to have a more concrete um, or palatable, shall I say, image uh, by having normally having like a more modern, you know, kind of fantasy setting in the. For example, in all across, we're, we are wearing normal clothes, but you know, f- from from modern day, rather than trying to recreate our own period pieces or that sort of thing. Largely, but yeah. t- they're they're heavily mismatched and turned into fantasy costumes, basically. So it's yeah. it's that kind of thing. So, but it's entirely up to the the viewer how they see it. I just I remember being very impressed by the visuals, um, but feeling that it felt a bit too Renaissance, play, uh, what do you call Renaissance fair, Ren fair, yeah. When I was watching that one, this is but, uh, not, not to say it's bad. It. Yeah, yes, yes, that's right. Ooh. I just felt like it. They'd all been to a ren fair and yeah. t- and come away with all the costumes. <laughs> Possibly, I think I'm a, I might be misremembering, but I, I think part of Hero Time seemed to have actually been filmed at a Renaissance. Oh, fair. absolutely. They, when yeah. they went to Hyrule Castle Town, which is my favourite bit of the. Mm. Oh yes, when the when the shop salesman does the chest opening theme with the pan pipes. Yes, he pulls out his little <laughs> pan pipe, which I think was pre Spirit Tracks that they may have filmed that, but no, who knows? Right. Um, and he he gets the pan pipes and that obviously, and he just goes, ah, you've got a bow. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Yeah, good very much enjoyed that certainly. Yeah, no, I think for me, Sage of Darkness, um, and people listening must check these out, by the way. You know, I, th- I think at least two-thirds of them are still available on the web in some form. Um, Certainly. Sage of Darkness, for me, fell, I think, right in between Hero of Time and uh, Legend of Link, mm. in that yes. there was... Yeah, there, they clearly hadn't had quite as much uh, as many resources to pull on as Hero of Time had to you know there was there was still some you know some things that were clearly just like ripped school shirts and things um, as uh, yeah, yes yes as as the costume of you know of a, of a highly, who would use ripped peasant. school shirts so, well, as the <laughs> terrible <laughs> um, <laughs> no. yes no the um uh, the village folk of, of, of Hyrule were, yeah, seem to be decked out in, in some fairly uh, modern shirts, um, albeit roughed up a bit. Um, and uh, and their Hyrule castle seemed, you know, seemed to be a, like I think I think it must have been mainly filmed in a church. Um, I, 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 yeah, it certainly, I, I looked look like a church. Um, yeah. in and fact, in I some think, ways, sorry, some of the room, yeah, 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 it was definitely like. I, Sorry, I'm misremembering something. There was, I think, there was some kind of like university hall, possibly uh, even 
even a, like a school of divinity or something like that it looked like to me in some some shots that makes yeah that makes uh some some sense yeah because um uh, i think yeah i think i think the um the group that were uh, I, can't, I forget their names but uh, i think i think the group were essentially a church group of some kind um and that's how they all knew each other um and uh, and you know for getting people together that's uh, that's as good a you know uh, as good a uh, leaning post as any uh, yeah, yeah. An established uh, established group like that so brilliant um but yes so there is the tangled web of of inspiration for uh, for making a zelda fan film mm. um when you just get so impatient waiting for the people who you really want to be making a film and you go ah i'll do it myself yeah mm. One of those odd situations in life, but there we go. Uh, <laughs> those moments never come again. So there we go. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, the fact that you, you know, it not only eventually finally came out, but the universe aligned and you were able to, to see it in a theater screen, um, you know, that kind of thing, you know, learning that that kind of thing is at least in some ways possible is what's always made it my ambition whenever I finish a project to do a screening you know even semi close to that um, on each occasion mm. it wasn't possible or, or well it wasn't practical because there, there weren't enough of us for like the, the ninja spin-off cast screening for for example I mean, it's, so just... it's it's hard enough to get the cast together to make the thing let alone to sit down and watch it I mean <laughs> for sure um, and then you know, getting uh, other you know uh, friends and interested people along as as well. It can be a bit of a wrangling job, but we did. You know, we, we've managed this probably most successfully when we uh, when we made the, this ten productions Phoenix Wright movie. Um, yes, I remember being there for that one. Biggest, <laughs> most enthusiastic, um, you know, uh, group of friends I think we've ever uh, assembled for. Uh, um, for a, for a screening of, of relative size, it wasn't a cinema. It was the you know it was the back room of a of a an Edinburgh pub that that does film screenings. So the you know the yes. the the screen itself was uh, well, kind of kind of been more than about uh, three or four meters diagonally, but uh, it was still you know comparatively it felt special you know um, for uh, for our level. Yes, certainly a very nice uh, screening, as I recall, which was good. Except for one, this was a place called the Brass Monkey in Edinburgh. Um, is that right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the place, yeah. Um, I only have one uh, bad memory of the evening, which was when um, one of the staff came in and, and quite rudely insisted that, that uh, I had to have a drink if I wanted to sit and watch this film. Yes. And yeah, I just sort of was, looked um... at him and I said, I'm sorry, I don't drink alcohol. And he goes, well, you need to buy a drink regardless. Uh, you don't have to drink mm. it. And I just sort of went, huh, I see. I, I get it. It's a bar. They wanted to make the money back on the on uh, on, on the tab or, or I don't know, however they do things in bars. But it was just the way he said it and, yeah. and whatnot. And everyone else had a beverage, but there we go. Anyway, so I, I went and bought a three-pound apple juice. And I didn't even drink it much because I just, you know, I'd only drink water. They wouldn't, water didn't count, by the way. Anyway, sorry I dragged that up. I just remember that. But other than that, it was no, a fantastic no, I, screening. Loved it. I do remember that thing. Yes, you, were, you weren't alone in that. They did insist that, that everyone have a, a drink of, uh, of some kind. And that was, um, there was possibly a miscommunication there because, uh, yeah, I was, I was led to believe as we, uh, when we organized the, the screening that, uh, that our fee for renting the room out covered everything that we yeah, uh, that we were yeah, required was, to uh, yeah. to pay but um hey I, you know uh, i i don't drink either um i yes i did buy uh, my own extortionate juice of some kind and uh yeah probably I just, orange knowing you I, <laughs> quite could well have been um but you know what i think there's a reason why i don't remember what juice i bought because i wasn't going to let that spoil the evening frankly well I said just, i was yes i was Delighted to have uh, to have got it that far, to be honest, you know, and, and not been tripped up by the need to, to to buy a drink because, and this is the the real crux of the matter. Um, we were all going in, in discrete groups to to the screening. Uh, most of us from uh, from my parents' house, um, and uh, when uh, I was kind of in uh, uh, in navigator mode because I was about to hop in the car, when I re realised that I'd left the DVD of the Phoenix Wright film <laughs> up in my bedroom. <laughs> So we very nearly left without it. In fact, huh, 
in fact, more just this is this is beyond unnecessary detail. But actually, yes, now that, now that I remember it, it wasn't just that. It was uh, I couldn't get the the car to start that I had a license that I was insured to drive, ah. um, and uh, and so my mum was going to give us a lift, and then she mysteriously couldn't get the car that she's insured to drive to start either. I think one of those was a very simple misunderstanding that that just the stress of the situation had, had brought out brought out rather than there actually being a problem with both of those cars ah. um, so in the end my group uh, all uh, you know uh, hustled onto an Edinburgh bus um, with the DVD case that, that we did at the last minute remember to check and it wasn't me that remembered it so if someone reminded me to go back and, and, and get it before and we get yeah. the movie yeah. so it was very nearly not a thing at all um, yeah, well, they, well, good. I'm glad that it worked out in the end. I remember being quickly conscripted. I mean, I was going to be driving there anyway. Um, sure. I think I had to take someone who was in a wheelchair. Is that right? Yes, that yes, was right. Have one one wheelchair user, and, that was which it, and they had to not. go in my my car. So we managed to get their wheelchair in my car. Um, mm-hmm. I had a tiny little Citroen back then. Uh, so yes, yes, we managed to do that. It was it was an adventure. Put it that way. So mm-hmm. it was uh, very good. Yes, um, so hard fought, but uh, but the day was won in the end. Just mm. mm-hmm. absolutely. Anyway, yes. So that, in in a nutshell, is is you know uh, a good a good emblem of my feelings towards getting something together that is able to then be shown on a relatively big screen to people. There's just something magical about it, in my opinion. Yes, absolutely. Doing the screening was was fantastic, and um, yeah just really nice to do it so that was really good fun um, I think that well that probably covers most of if not all of our the origin our, story our, yes. our beginning of you know how this all you know you know started out back in the day I suppose I, I, I had actually forgotten a number of those I've re- remembered them as we went through it obviously which was quite good but mm-hmm. uh, yeah no, that's Such good a memory. it's a funny funny thing um, good to think about them Good, well, let's leap from, from that rather nicely bookended uh, segment into just whatever other general gubbins I've still got written down here. Um, I uh, had a thread to pick at for uh, Please Save My Tomorrows, um, which is about, um, I just I, I suppose I just uh, wondered about the the conclusion to, uh, to Please, because I know we've, um, yes. we've talked about where a lot of the ideas came from for things like Saran, um, and we talked previously about the, the designs, um, some of which didn't, you know, didn't make it to the, the final version. But um, mm. uh, the um, the story and the episode count feels kind of nicely segmented uh, off into you know there's this allotment for the for the first of the four next eye and the, the yes you know, this amount for the for the second and so forth, and then the. The kind of the finale and the final nexus is the burning nexus the final one am I remembering that yes right? that's correct so they kind of fall into one in the end and the, and the burning nexus becomes a little bit more of a background detail it's uh, just there to, yeah to the truth yeah um, was there more intended more flesh hundred percent there was nexus, yeah. or? I remember this very clearly mm-hmm. um yeah, so the burn, you've, those who you've just said it yourself, obviously they visit uh, Fruit Bowl Swamp to where the Twirling Nexus is, they visit uh, Patch Canyon where the Quaking Nexus is, the Splashing Nexus in the tropics, and uh, the final one is the Burning Nexus in the the, nor- the northern mountain range of, of Zoologic. Um, mm. Which, and here's the thing, uh, it's, it's actually Sky Vault where the Burning yes. Nexus is. Now, originally, yeah, yeah. what was going to happen is Trip... Uh, and his and crew, Trip, Mally, and Bark were going to arrive at the Burning Nexus um, before going back to to Spiral Town to kick off the 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 final arc or the final showdown, you know, area basically kind of thing. But um, mm-hmm. what what actually happened uh, was that they get to the or sorry, what was going to happen was they go to the the mountains and Mally's all excited because uh, she's going to get to see Sky Vault which Tripp's been telling her about this whole time this incredibly advanced Magitech city that's that uh, you know she's never been to etc and uh, couldn't believe that there was a, a place like that you know to the north etc hadn't heard of it before and um, 
they get there and uh, it's not actually anything spectacular it's uh there's no like magic gear there's no this that or the next thing or whatnot there um and uh, trip is very confused by this because as far as he's concerned he he left sky vault just you know well three days ago <laughs> but more than three days ago but um and he can't understand where his home has gone but it, it was a sort of gladiator styled coliseum city with inhabited by dragon people or dragon humans and their champion uh, Draconis Barquest um, you, in order to visit the burning nexus and to, to get the I think it was like some kind of holy blessing or be, be able to sort of um, you know be be close and see the holy flame or, or something like that or whatever it is in their in their town uh, mm. or, or city I should say um, which was this big kind of Roman sort of or stone kind of structure you know castle fort a vault basically a big big thing on the on the on the, the mountain built into the mountains essentially was the idea and uh, you had to defeat this guy in combat to, or or get through the the games basically in order to survive and uh you know get this holy blessing from the flame or whatever it was and of course that was the burning nexus and they had to get to it to do the the unlocking thing and and, and the ring power up etc so that was the idea there and yeah. Um, at one point, there was even an idea that um, there was that Draconis Barquest, the, the guy there, he the, only once in like a hundred years or something um, could a, is a dragon man born or something like that. I think it was, and that right. they can use dragonic styled magic. And that was at the point where Trip's power up rings were more powerful because uh, they they took on dragonic magic. Uh, in addition to regular elemental magic to them. And upon meeting Trip in combat and Trip using these sort of this dragonic magic against him, he's very confused because he should be the only one who's able to use dragonic magic because it's only once every hundred years that someone is able to, is born with that ability basically. And that lies into the question of, you know, how can there be two of them in the same hundred years? And that's, Trip is from the future obviously, and that's where Sky Vault mm -hmm. will be. Yes. Basically, so that was that was the idea behind that. Uh, there may have been other smaller details, but that was the basic. Hopefully, that all made sense. That was the idea. They were going to get through that, do that, and then um, go back to Spiral Town, and and then it pre it pretty much, you know, Doug would have finished as the show did, with the exception of not going to the Burning Nexus, and uh, the final battle would have been in Spiral Town. In fact, I think we even right. killed off Tara in Sky Vault instead of in in. Uh, yeah. In Spiral Town. So, yeah. It, well, Tara and Ralph. Yeah. Mm. yeah. No, very interesting. Because, mm. um, uh, yes, I mean, it's 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 kind of uh, wrapped up in the in the more personal drama at that point in uh, uh, in Please as it as it exists. So it doesn't. Yes. Uh, yeah. It, it, the the focus of the of the show is is already where it uh, where it kind of needs to be and the the hand wave is is really just brushing aside something that's already kind of been forgotten by that stage but uh, yeah. yeah no it's interesting to know what uh, what could have been mm. the, yeah there, there wasn't anything in there that was was essential likely why it was cut obviously but uh, mm. <laughs> that was that no we we the the reason obviously there there are four nexus we had to we had to do do them all so that's why the burning nexus got shoved into the the bit there with with where Sarong is at the, at the end, it's just a just a mountain range. Um, hmm. But um, the splashing nexus is probably of the three, you know, major arcs before the finale arc. Um, it, it it lends itself most to potentially being filler, but it gave us a chance to give Bark more to do, which I thought was very. Um, Essential yes. <laughs> to Important. the yeah. thing because jo Bark only joins them at the end of of the the canyon arc proper, even though he does do plenty in that obviously because it is his focus point. Um, hmm. But I I felt that giving him uh, more to do in the Splashing Nexus, especially with his story uh, of you know you know wanting to get revenge, basically paralleling the Captain Bernie Biscuit uh, hmm. <laughs> um, into well, that. That's the so, thing. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I agree. It was it's uh, it's an important uh, point to to flesh or an important character rather to flesh out on. But um, the uh, the the splashing nexus is also kind of the the I suppose the last remnant of uh, of an element of 
because when you're drawing from Majora's Mask, it's you know it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of you know emotionally affecting and then and kind of thematically stirring stuff, um, and so I think in kind of earlier stages when you talked through what you what you wanted to lift from Majora's Mask, there was originally more of the um, uh, of the timeline crossing um, elements. Yes. yes. So, uh, of course, the, the fact that we're rewinding the same series of days remains in, in Please, but in Majora's Mask, that's used so that you can see details that are going to become important later on play out in the background um, mm. and and then experience them more directly when you decide to engage with those on a on a future you know on a future loop um, and we sort of have the we, we the one area where we sort of have the, the leftover remnants of, of that is in what in the end was captain dustin biscuit into Hi. bernie biscuit yeah, um, yes but but the fact that the captain's biscuits, um, you know, uh, link to each other first from being, you know, one of them being present in the, uh, what's it, <laughs> yes. the um, zoologic inn, followed by us actually seeing the eventual uh, Bernie Biscuit story play out near the splashing nexus is, again, just a, it's an artifact of it. It's not, you know, it's not the the meat of it is not still there, but it's it's the evidence of. of as I as I see it, it, must be the 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 evidence of of uh, an element of of you know background element that then surfaces to the forefront and say uh, later on as the mm. characters focus shifts towards it. Because um, uh, I think I, I think another I mean, this is slightly out on a limb, but I I have uh, a memory of the villain whether whether it was. Going to be Sarong at that Sarong at that point, or whether it was still F- uh, Fant Mandela who was to be the the final big bad. Mm. Um, I, th- I think your ideas around that time uh, were were more to the. How do I put this? So, so Sarong's final, um, a, the final um, kind of vice that that. Uh, that makes him, you know, that corrupts him in, in the end is being, you know, is uh, connected to the kind of the the loneliness of a of a time traveler. Um, in that you go through these these cycles, you know, observing the world but never truly getting to to integrate with it um, on this quest. And you've been lucky enough to to have a connection with one particular person along the way that you're then forced to to give up in the end. Mm. Um, and that's how Sarong ends up. But I think earlier on, it sounded like you were much more leaning towards um, something more directly um, focused on the, the the slow corrosion of a person's soul that occurs when they are forced to, to exist in this loop for such yes. a long time. Yeah, originally it was, bas- to, to sum that up and cap it, it's basically, it was meant to be uh, another version of Trip who'd done all of this and failed and failed and failed and failed and failed. <laughs> there we are, yeah. That was that was it, and it and it was, and uh, hence the the and the belt, the helping hand is that he has is by that point corrupted into the the hurtful hand, the, the evil driver. Hmm. Um, and then in the end, I just decided to make it a different guy. <laughs> so. Yeah. It, it was an interesting concept, but I couldn't quite because of the whole time travel thing. I wasn't sure you know about you know where the ins and outs were and i felt it was i actually preferred what it became as yeah. opposed to just being like ah oh, the villain is actually trip again because i don't know i just yeah i preferred it that way but i mean there was not to say that there wasn't potential in the the initial idea of an evil trip and it would it gave um uh a neat little you know point into the idea of that like trip would stop himself and, and that yeah. sort of thing Sarong is essentially just another trip uh, yeah. in that sense as well. It's just he's is a different person. Obviously, he's from the same time as Trip. In fact, the the thing that the only thing that's uh, different about them is that Sarong is amazing at magic and all this stuff, whereas Trip isn't. Um, yeah. but, but the difference is is that you know Sarong is not a nice person. Sarong is is a very greedy and you know you know it doesn't think about others in the same. At least not 
you know, by the end of it, he's not able to maintain, keep that, that any form of his, his, perhaps his former goodness that he that he did have, which as shown in mm -hmm. the flashback. Whereas um, Trip does have the ability to let go in the end mm -hmm. uh, for the greater good. Uh, I think that's that's yes. the key point there. That's uh, that made please such a yes. such a success in its own way. I don't want to say success because I, I hate using that word. Oh, with well, I will. Yeah, I think, I think please was a was a resounding success in terms of bringing something so ambitious to to the screen and putting you know Certainly. putting such a lot of hard work into into something that that you know it paid off. Um, because you're right that it doesn't Sarang doesn't need to actually be Trip for him to be Trip yeah. if that makes sense like I know what you mean he's, yeah. he's been recruited for the same task he's been you know and he's gone through the same journey the, the difference is you know uh, how you know uh, how the two of them then, then what the two of them then to choose to do differently with that experience um, exactly hmm there we go. Well, I know we still have a bit left here to go, um, but I'm going right to. I, I, I think we're. Thank you for listening, everyone. We've had a really good uh, discussion about the yes. beginning, uh, the middle, with please, uh, yeah, and yes. uh, and the end, or the not well, the current end anyway, the, the, the of fate. For so now, a good yes. cover for now. We hope. Uh, <laughs> so there we go. Um, thank you again for joining us, and uh, please do send questions in because uh, we, we do love answering them, and it gives gives us food for thought to delve into to other things. I know that we have, you know, at this point we are really looking at that we've covered just about everything that's that's out there. But uh, I'm hoping that as we we move on and do these videos, we'll be able to talk more about um, uh, newer stuff. It's just that I am still one of those people who doesn't want to spoil what's going to happen. Perhaps to my detriment of not advertising and not showing certain things, but I think that uh, in the end, the payoff for all of you who've been supporting us will will be worth it. I really hope so. Anyway, so there we go. And I will say just as as one thing, because we mentioned this today with swear words and whatnot. If you thought it was bad and fake, oh boy, <laughs> wait till we get to this one. Oh dear. Right. Pearl okay. Ready for clutching, everyone. Thank yep. you very much. Take care, everyone. <laughs>